Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org consequence and the consequence podcast network. Thanks as always for making your way here and checking out the series. Of course, you know what to do. If you like what you see, what you hear hit that subscribe button to put out three new interviews every single week. So it's a great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. And I'm so excited today. Tommy Stinson is here. We're going to be talking about Cowboys in the Campfire, and we're going to be talking about The Replacements. Tim, new reissue. Uh, hello, sir. Hi. It's great to see you. How are you? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing all right over here. Um, and uh, honestly, it's it's a pleasure having you on here. You've been such a big part of so many amazing acts over the years, and, and you're continuing uh, I want to talk about Cowboys in the Campfire in just a moment, but I also want to tell you how much I'm enjoying this brand new record that you guys have put out. Oh, well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> funny road, that one. <laughs> it's because it's, that's what that's started. Would you, well, it's, it's been almost like a decade project in the making. Is that right? You know, I, I guess you could say that. I mean, Chip Robertson, and I have been writing since I met him. He's my ex-wife's uncle. And when we moved east with our little baby at the time, Tallulah, um, he and I became fast friends. And I finished up, I, I, was, I was making at the time when I met him, I was finishing up a solo record called um, One Man Mutiny. And I basically finished that in his basement. Uh, and, and we've been writing since then. So, you know, with our lives and schedules and all that kind of stuff going on and, and all that, we... Uh, you know, we eked out a record after 10 years. <clears throat> That's not to say, I mean, he's, he's also played, he played on One Man Mutiny, he played on the Bash and Pop record I did, the newer one. He's been involved in all these things, but we finally got our, we, we got enough material together to finally put out a record. So, yeah. So, so here we it's, go. There's such a cool mood on it. I think you've talked about in the press release about, especially being inspired a little bit by the classic country that you grew up on, that your parents were listening to with, uh, with Conway Twitty. And uh, I think you mentioned Tanya Tucker, maybe. Uh, yeah. In there. Yeah. Like how did, how did that find its way in? Because maybe that's always been a part of your DNA. Like I understand it. I was, when you, when I read that, it made me think about the stuff that I grew up listening to that I probably rejected from my parents for a little while and then came back around to realizing how much you know that ended up meaning something to me that that's pretty much that sums up pretty much exactly the scenario here that I, I could tell you about this so I never um it wasn't so much that I I was inspired by I mean I think that press release might be a little bit misleading in this but um it, in terms of you know having any sort of singer songwriter country or um you know those kinds of things in the mix growing up in the replacements i mean there was always fucking um you know hank williams going in the you know and then black flag and then you know we'd be bouncing around with all this different stuff from everyone's you know musical backgrounds really but um in terms of looking back on it i never really you know, and I still don't. I mean, I'm not like I didn't I didn't didn't seek to make a country ish record or anything like that. Basically, what Chip and I did was we figured out that we're a duo. And so we you know, we've been touring around just the two of us playing these songs that we'd written and I like wanted to keep it as, as as simple and to that point as possible. Although as I started, you know, producing the thing. Songs lead needed things that I felt um that they were asking for really um and so it turned out the way it was the way it did it's really just a stripped down record of basically the same kind of shit I've always kind of written there's always been a bit of a singer songwriter country country tinge to everything whether the replacements or me after the replacements there's always been that in there from my upbringing I mean listening to you know you know, all the different stuff I grew up listening to, it's all in there always, you know. So I never, so, you know, I didn't really, you know, intend to make that kind of record per se, but this is what we got. Sure. Yeah. And you put in just a little bit of the different clothing on it. And I think, you know, once you, once you call it Cowboys on the Campfire, I mean, that's what really cements it in our heads. That gives us that mood. Yeah. And, and I, I, I guess that goes by design, you know. <laughs> 
that's <laughs> that, that that's how that works yeah. yeah and it's um really not i mean to, to further on what you're saying because not in a rip misrepresentation manner but it's if i if if you hadn't heard it and you're only going by what you and i just said you'd yeah. probably have this idea of what the album is and it's not exactly that because you're right it is a singer songwriter and you get these um even you know rhinestone cowboy moments so i'm talking about the sweeping orchestration that goes through it and, and the type of melodies that you're using i mean schemes yeah that slide guitar can't help or whatever that is can't really yeah. help you but put in a certain mood and and souls and the way it builds and sweeps yeah. and it is more there, there's so many creative moments going into this yeah i mean so i mean you 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 could derive a certain thing from the title of the record and me and you discussing it to a degree but really there there is a lot of different things in there and i you know i, I keep telling people this you know with my songwriting it's like i the songs pretty much dictate what they want I, I don't really I've I've tried to force my will on songs and I've done I've grown up in the replacements, you know, where we try to force our will on songs to try and make them this when they wanted to be that. And when you grow up doing that, you see the, you know, the shortcomings of that that desire. You know, some songs really do, you know, they they speak to you. They want something more out of it. And you it's up to you to figure out what that is, you know. These songs, they um they were meant, they were written by Chip and I. You know, we toured around and, and they evolved in our touring and stuff that ch and things changed and, and evolved by the time we got to recording them, that by the time we got to the recording process, we had a pretty good idea what those songs wanted and that. And then on top of that, you know, they, they spoke to us more. So, you know, all these things kind of come together and, you know, that's what you end up with the finished product is, you know, the songs finally get what they, you know, they presented the way it's like your little kids when they grow up and they go off to college, you know, that's kind of that vibe. Yeah. Chris can't be up. overlooked that, uh, you know, there is a nice guest on here, uh, John Doe, uh, yeah. him on here many, many times. And what he's, he's playing there. Uh, is he upright bass that he's on? Stand up bass. Yeah. He never, it's the first time he recorded stand up bass with anybody. Um, we just happened to be going through, through Austin and he had just moved there. And we called him over to the studio and to hang out. And, um, you know, I told him before I got there, I said, I got like five songs or something like that. You feel like playing? And he was totally down for it. He came over, he played, and he sang. We had such a good time. That, the, the first song, the first five songs that comprised this record were the first songs that, that these they were like the, the centerpiece of the whole record. Um, the ones we did with him. Once we did those five songs, it was clear to us that we needed to, one, you know make a full record because at that point we weren't really even, even talking about making a record we just talking about we we'll get these five songs let's record them with john doe hey whatever he's here you know um and so having done that you know it started it started the ball rolling of you know that was sort of the nucleus of the whole record right there yeah. and the songs that the songs that comprised that moment would have been um mr wrong um karma's bitch uh um but i'm bum 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 and three others <laughs> <laughs> three others and we, i believe yeah. you. i know we, that's we, a we, we ain't is in there that he did um uh hey man uh -huh. was on that um, yeah. recently yeah so yeah we started off with those songs and we kind of built around it and you know most of it live i mean we did a lot of that just kind of on the fly yeah see so. and and you're so close because of the heritage of both of you all if he had just finished out the record and then you call the super group, that's all it takes. That's yeah, it. Yeah. You know, I mean, John Doe has been a good friend of mine for fuck almost 40 years, man. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, um, <laughs> just funny to say that really, but, but, um, no, he's been a very, very good friend to me. Uh, yeah. Well, as we talk about the past too, uh, I want to bring up, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Tim is uh, the latest to get the reissue treatments in the replacements yeah. catalog. And gets a bit of a remix um, as as one of the the, the big selling points, I think, uh, along with the more tracks from the uh, Alex Chilton sessions. And we've got a live album on here. When you remix something like this, when when you go back to a classic, something that is embedded in so many people's memory to sound a certain way, 
not to say that it's dangerous because whatever, fuck that. You can always go back to the original. But but what exactly. is it that you, you all wanted to pull out of it? Is it anything specific? So how these things work with these um, box sets is it, they, it's been Bob Mayer that's leading the parade, the parade on these. And, and if it were left to the replacements, me, Paul, and Chris, that is, um, we would have never released any of these extra material, any of this extra stuff at all. We wouldn't have done that. That's um, because there's a reason why it didn't make the record. There's a reason why it's been in the vault, all the above. But um, what Bob has managed to do with, you know, starting with his book and stuff is peak people's interest in the bigger story per record. And so, um, you know, by him going in and seeing what's out there and what's, you know, what was, what's, you know, in the vaults and that kind of thing, he's managed to pull together and help Warner Brothers throw together interesting packages that um, the fans are really into. And so for our, you know, for my book, like I said, we would have never done this, but because um, because Bob has done such a good job of it, and people are really um, uh, revering them as you know quality things and stuff like that, we are uniquely in a you know this place where our music is really relevant still um, to some degree with you know modern culture and rock and roll and you know indie indie radio you know has gone by the wayside, but you know we were part of that, and I think. Um, you know, there's still people want to hear more, know more about the story. And I think Bob's lined that up to have these box sets do tell the story. Um, and, you know, with that, there's, you know, comes the butt puckering moments of like stuff, the outtake stuff you don't really want to hear that, like I said, we would never put out. But because the fans want that, I think it tells the bigger story about each record as it happens. I think you know we're we've acquiesced on it and you know cool you know because like i said we're we're still finding ourselves kind of uniquely um relevant right now which is it's great you know we couldn't be more grateful for that so when you take all that into consideration um you know all the outtakes and the weird stuff you know the you know it tells the bigger story about yeah. the about that particular time you know yeah it, it, and Yes, you are very much still relevant. I mean, I know it's been told many, many times, but even like, God, it's been a few years, but Lord, the artist Lord coming out and doing Swing and Party, which, you know, is is kind of a cool introduction to that whole generation there. I still hear the music in television movies uh, and and whatnot. But it is, as fans, I like to listen to this, and I imagine that Wait, is. What, that what was that last thing you said? Was it Lord? That Lord. Did, Lord that did Swing and Party? Lord did Swing and Party. Yeah, is she that covered did that? actually. Actually, not just live. She she released a, a, a studio version of Swing and Party as a B side. I remember hearing that on something. I was and I just and I always forgot to ask, what the fuck was that? Because <laughs> I heard it, I heard it in the somewhere, and I was like, and I, I I wasn't with anyone that had any idea what the fuck I was talking about. It must have been like a restaurant or something. I'm going, what? And then I forgot to follow up and find out what that was. But it was her, huh? It was Lord. So yeah, you're, and like, you know, that's, that's the, the, the pop, you know, temple right now, part of, part of that world, you know, Lord and Lana and Taylor and everything. So it's interesting. I'm interested in, in who's heard that, you know, yeah. of this, of this younger generation and, and what, if they've picked up on, you know, the ones who take it further. Yeah. Did she pick it? Did she, was she a fan of that? Or did someone say, Hey, you might want to try this. This might be kind of cool. You know, I mean, you know what, like what happened there you know? yeah she seems like she's got taste though but i will say as you know talking about this because i know it's different for the artist and i think that's for a lot of people you know you hear about that with prince and he you know he kept the vault shut for a reason now it's open that he's gone but do you get into any of that with other artists like did you check out the beatles stuff you know the deep when they started doing that same thing in the past few years like do you have that thing how that works you know <laughs> um that's kind of the rub. So as much as we can poo poo how much we would never have put out these extra tracks and all that stuff, we were all four of us, all four of us in the replacements, we're all totally into the big star out 
takes the fucking Bob Dylan, this, that, all the other stuff. We are totally the fanboys like that, that are always into that. So we'd be, you know, being very hypocritical to say, well, nah, no one's going to want to hear that from us, you know, that kind of thing. And as it turns out, you know, we're wrong. I mean, we'd be wrong to say that people, I mean, if you're really that much of a music fan, all those things tell the story that people are interested in, just like we're interested in it, whether it's Bob Dylan, Rolling Stones or fucking The Clash, whatever. So you got to take all that into consideration with this. And and that's how I've had to, I've kind of stepped back from it. And, and you know, Bob, like I said, Bob, I, Bob Mayer's done a good job with this stuff uh, with Warner Brothers. And, you know, if they were doing shoddy, just throwing crap against the wall, I, I think we would probably have put our foot down on, on that. Mm-hmm. But because they're well received and it seems he's doing a really good job with it, there, it's a, it's it's a good combo to let it go and okay all right all right you can let the butt puckery moment go see you later i'll talk to you you know that kind of thing. well you know some of that story that you're talking about it's interesting hearing how many ways that you all tried to make can't hardly wait possibly work for this record you know i think there's three different versions and eventually yeah. even gets pushed down to the next one and and you know just revisiting those other great moments i mean dose of thunder like that bass really dances you know and for yourself and maybe not considering what you've already just said but do you find that you had demo itis are are there any moments on here that you go you know i think that there is some more magic in that demo than maybe you know because that happens yeah, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't involved myself enough to, to get to that point with any of them, but I do know that um, Nowhere Is My Home was always a lost uh, a lost gem. Um, uh, and and you, you can't, um, not for nothing, you really can't discount that um, um, Here Comes a Regular was a second take and that's that was it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the magic in that you can't really you can't discount that that's a you know a moment and you know I think you know looking at our legacy I think I I think some of our best works that people still hold to have that vibe about them we you know before we got into having budgets to really noodle around with too many overdubs and spend too much time overthinking shit we did things pretty much live and you know while we had the, the the lightning in a bottle moment, you know, and I think that stuff stands up and that's, and it's, and it stands up because of that. We were, we were at our strongest when we were in the moment in a particular right there, like it's 345, we're rolling tape. It would have never happened if we'd started at 350. I mean, it's just like that, that finite moment. We really captured that as a band throughout our career for the most part the later records a little harder to find those gems in that regard because we got there was there was a trade-off i think it was more of a trade-off of trying to find and dig out what songs might have wanted more than than them just showing themselves you know yeah well on top of that i mentioned um you know a couple of the other bits that you do get the uh more of the uh the alex chilton sessions in here i'd wondered a little bit about that like so much of that has been probably mythologized at this point you know you were there is the is the myth bigger than the reality in those moments no i mean the 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 reality i mean yeah (laughs) to some degree i mean there's really not much to the myth i mean the reality is um we met alex and we're enamored with them i think paul was probably more so than than even i or anything anything like that but but when we when we came up with the idea of having him produce, it was it was a good idea to us and sounded good until it wasn't. I mean, it just kind of came to a point where I think our you know romanticized idea of what he would, could bring to the table were quickly dashed. I think um, not for anything, not for not for anything bad about him or anything. I think what we might have expected from him was something he had no idea of how to bring to the table or knew what the fuck we were even, what it was that we wanted from him, you know? Um, 
Um, and that's why we end up with Tommy early. Cause I think the record company and we just decided we've realized that, yeah, maybe this, this isn't exactly what we need, how this can work and how we can make a record. So Tommy early enters a picture to try and rein it all in and make it make sense. You know? Yeah. It's interesting to hear those things. And, and I'll quickly bring up the, uh, the, there's the live recording from 1986 on here. Uh, do you have any recollections, uh, recollections of that show? Not really um, at, at all. I mean, you gotta, uh, for me, we were touring a lot then. I mean, from the time that I dropped out of school in the middle of my 10th grade and Peter Jesperson was kind of given guardianship to, uh, for me so I could leave the state and tour. We toured a lot, you know, we're, we're, you know, when I look at that time, I just seems to me like we're always on the road. I had this apartment that I, I remember a little about being in, but I had my own apartment that, you know, at 17, that was a cool apartment, but I don't, I don't remember spending all that time. <laughs> we're gone so much, you know. Well, blame me. I can't remember most of the last couple of decades and that's not for just because, you know, so asking about one singular show, 35 years ago or whatever and i think i would be surprised if you could. thousands of shows i played over the course of my life yeah i don't fucking remember nothing about that show <laughs> straight up <laughs> well it sounds like a fun Full show stop. i'll at least say it's fun to listen to it's a good show <laughs> to hear well that's what i'm told i mean i i had to defer because i there's two things i can't do with this stuff i can listen to the stuff that i'm interested in and the stuff that i know is going to be cringy i just i have to defer because i uh, and I defer to people I trust with my life on these things. Um, Peter Jesperson being one of them. And uh, I don't necessarily trust Bob, Bob Muir with my life, but I trust that what he's doing and where he's going, where the people are 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 back. And and you know, like I said, I I, I defer to him because I can't really listen to it. Yeah, it's a good set. It's a great album, and I will. Uh, repeat myself when I say the same thing about your latest with uh, with Cowboys and Campfire. You guys are doing some tour dates as well. In yeah, September. we're heading, we're heading out on the fifth fifth of, of September, starting in Portland, Maine. We're gonna work our way down the East Coast, and then uh, with a little luck, we're gonna do the West Coast in November. Um, once the uh, rains, earthquakes, floods, and fires are done, <laughs> you I, know, was just, I was texting. You have to dodge, right? What's that? I said, you know, yeah, right. What do you have to dodge out there, right? Just exactly. everything. Exactly. I moved to LA 30 years ago this summer. And when I got there, fires, floods, earthquakes, all within the first six months. I was looking at my girlfriend at that time in the car, in the, in the car as we were kind of seeking shelter from the earthquake. And I'm just crying. It was scary as fuck. And I'm looking at her going, what was I thinking? why did i come here oh sorry you know, i love you yeah <laughs> <laughs> messed up but and here, here we are again. again yeah right <laughs> i had a good run i had a good run there i'll just leave it at that <laughs> well uh safe travels out there and uh and i do hope i'll see you know this project out on the road you know if you uh, if you drop by louisville you can always say hi to us over here as well but You're um, in louisville? i'm in louisville man yeah. Dude, we're gonna be by there. We've been meaning to get back. I haven't been back to Louisville since I got my haircut. We played some cool place, and this guy gave me a haircut. Um, oh, nice! In his shop, like right next door, or something like that. Yeah, something. yeah. He got, he got my hair with a broken bottle. Is that true? Or are you just? Yeah, making no, I'm not. I'm not. I got tips. You could look in. I think you can go into my Instagram feed and find that from five, six years ago yeah. or something. Yeah, he's we've got real barbers here too. But yeah, it's. Uh... <laughs> Hey, get that spiky hairdo. You know, it's a little flat today because I, you know, it's a hat day. But. Right. Yeah. Drop by anytime. Uh, Tommy, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Seriously. Uh, thank cool. you so much for taking the time. And, uh, and we'll see you around soon. Absolutely, man. You have yourself a great day. And thanks to my guest. Also, thanks to you. For, uh, for checking out the episode in the series. Before you get out of here, hit that subscribe button. 
Again, uh, you get three brand new interviews every single week, new and every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at uh, right here on YouTube or, of course, anywhere in podcast land, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchaser, NPR, or WFPK.org as well. A great way to keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones as well. Then after that, actually head over to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. It's an hour full of song premieres, music news, anniversary spins, bonus interviews, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern at WFPK.org. Consequence has your music and film news. You can also find me on the social media spots, uh, Facebook, Instagram, mostly on Twitter. All three of them, the address is at Kyle Meredith. Do hope you like and follow along. That does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time.